All right, so Stephen has been doing some research into banking. Um, how many people out there use things like Quicken and things like that to, uh, to fill out the spreadsheet for you? Yeah? Okay, this is a security conference, so you all fail. Um, you can uh, turn your mother's maiden name at the desk on your way out. Um, that stuff's always kind of given me the creeps. That's why I use Redacted, uh, and I fill everything in by hand. And uh, to validate that decision, uh, let's give a big hand to Steven. Thank you very much, great time, man. Take a quick drink of Pepsi. <laughs> so, uh... I want to say first off, uh, this is my seventh DEF CON, my first time on stage. I am super excited uh, to be giving back to this community uh, finally and share some, share some knowledge of uh, what I've been working on for, uh, for about six months, all told. So, <clears throat> hacking banks, because that's where the money is. Uh, what was my motivation? Uh, I think there's a lot of community overlap uh, with, excuse me, with uh, the f tech geeks and finance geeks. A lot of people I work with uh, are finance geeks as well. Um, I like to hack things that I, uh, I use. I like to hack things that are in my own backyard. I want to make my life safer uh, and, uh, and then, you know, improve the world around me through making my life safer. And uh, I don't write banking software. I'm a pen tester by, tr uh, by, by job, uh, so I'm just a guy with curl and Python and some curiosity. And I'll kind of walk you through uh, how I went from zero to this talk in, uh, in the last six months. I'm sitting at home, I'm using Quicken. I uh, am security aware, I've got two-factor in all my accounts. I load up my bank account in Quicken. But the password doesn't work with a two-factor. Well, surely typing the password without two factors, that's not going to work. Nope, it does. So what's going on here? Just plain text password. Is there a separate server? Is there a separate protocol? How is Quicken and other, other desktop software talking to my bank uh, that's not just going through the, the web page? So let's talk about Quicken. Uh, Quicken is uh, one of what the financial industry calls a personal financial management software. Uh, you've probably seen these names. Everyone, a lot of people raise their hand. Mint.com is very popular. Um, PFM is the industry term. Uh, I'll start throwing that around. I have a bunch of bank accounts. Uh, some people collect credit cards. Uh, sorry, I collect credit cards. Some people collect baseball cards. Uh, some people have way too many domain names. Uh, I have way too many bank accounts. I, they give you bonuses when you sign up. And, uh, and I, I, like, I like understanding, like from a practical, real uh, sense, how, how financial system works. So uh, I've got, let's say, less than 100, more than 20 bank accounts that I, uh, I want to manage. And that's good, that becomes a pain. So I want, I want some simple aggregator client that I don't have to write myself uh, that'll just keep track of my transactions every month. I use Quicken personally. It's the devil I know. It's terrible. I love to hate it. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend any of these. Um, uh, I, wish, I wish there was one that I could recommend to you. So let's start from the user's experience. Uh, this is the Quicken UI. On the left-hand side, uh, you've got your list of bank accounts. Uh, it also does loans and credit cards. On the right-hand side, you've got a, a big transaction list. So everything you, you bought, who you paid, what you paid when. It's pretty, pretty standard for, for balancing your checkbook. So you first install a program like Quicken, and this is what happens. You have to enter in your account info. First, you tell it what kind of account you have. It's quite a, quite a large selection of banking products that we all use. Then uh, you pick your bank name, uh, and it does uh, basically a name to sort of uh, URL lookup, a DNS-like lookup. Um, that's called the branding service. Then you pick out how you want to connect. Usually there's just one way. Sometimes there's multiple ways. We'll go into that. 
Then you type in your credentials into this totally not your bank's website uh, form where you put your plain text password. It somehow finds your account. You pick the one that you want to uh, interact with in the app. And voila, it starts downloading your transactions. That's what the user sees. So what's going on in the background? There are three ways in which Quicken uh, and, uh, and sort of other financial management software uh, talks to your bank. Um, the Quicken, these are the Quicken brand names. One's called WebConnect. Uh, WebConnect is a fancy way for saying you go to your website, you type in your creds, you go download a file, and you manually import it into the app. Uh, it, Web Connect's easier to say. Express Web Connect is uh, Quicken has a bot that does that for you. It's all manual. Direct Connect is what we're going to talk about. It's a programmatic, structured uh, query language based on the OFX protocol that talks directly between your client and your bank. So again, in picture form, you are the middleman on Web Connect. Uh, an Intuit server is the middleman on Express Web Connect, and Direct Connect is you actually talking directly with your bank. It's the minimal amount of trust relationship. Financial institution here is also the industry term uh, for bank or credit card or investment account or 401k. I'll start saying FI or financial institution from here on out now that you're, you're in with the banker lingo with me. Another step here uh, is account aggregators. These are important to understand. Uh, so every bank, if you have to actually connect and go download a file, well, they all do it a little differently. So someone realized that there was a business here creating one unified API, their own proprietary API, and then screen scraping as a service to all these other banks. Uh, so there's a couple, uh, these are the big names in account aggregation. Um, Yodely's the biggest. They've actually been around for like 20 years. Uh, they also clean and normalize the data, so um, you know, so your, your your names of like the companies that you bought stuff from and what type of purchase it is all gets all gets canonicalized across multiple institutions. They they, they provide a good service, and, and to the end user application developer, they provide a consistent API. So like, if you want to write your own banking app, you don't have to talk to thousands of different banks individually. Uh, but they also add yet another layer of trust. So now my plain text password goes from my computer to personal capital web application, uh, PFM, to Yodly, and then to my financial institution where they do some screen scraping or maybe make that direct connection to OFX for me. I have to trust that every one of these hops has my own financial best interest in mind and that they are all competent enough to protect a secret. The first is easier to believe than the latter. So hopefully you're seeing, as I did, that this whole architecture uh, is, is lacking uh, in least privilege. Uh, and this is bullshit. Like, these are our banks. These are, hey Joel, these are our, these are our money. Uh, why do I have to give full read-write access to third-party software to, uh, to just you know, balance my checkbook every month and trust some, you know, the latest financial app who's then giving my read-write password to a third party and then to another third party? What's definitely needed here is some kind of uh, OAuth tokenized app-based access control where I can say, hey, Quicken, you can, you know, you can go to uh, you can go to my Bank of America account if you only have read-only access uh, and only for 30 days, and then talk to me after 30 days, and I'll, and I'll re-up your privileges. That's what we need. That is not what we have in 2018 in banking personal finance. So that's the end user perspective. Uh, let's get technical. I'm going to start at the specification level, uh, walk you guys through how things could work, and then we'll talk about implementations and deployments and how things actually work. 
The OFX protocol is an open spec. There's a group of companies that build it. Uh, it's uh, freely available for download and perusal and implementation. Uh, you can go grab this spec right now and, and read along with me if you'd like. OFX is this proto web service. It was actually invented in 1997. So it's before like we even had REST as a term, but it passes, uh, passes messages that are structured over uh, HTTP, sends a request, gets back a response. It can do pretty much anything that a normal consumer would want to do with their bank. You can, you know, checking savings account, uh, your IRA, credit card transactions, you can do bill pay. Those, those first three on the left there, kind of read-only operations. On the right, uh, writable operations. Uh, wiring money to foreign uh, banks. Transferring between counts, accounts at your bank. Transferring to accounts at different banks. It's up to each financial institution to sort of decide how much of the spec and the protocol that they, uh, they implement. Uh, no one really implements them all, um, as, as we'll see. It also does taxes. Uh, I didn't really research into that too much, but TurboTax um, that uh, I use and a lot of people use uh, also pulls a lot of data through this protocol. And then that's kind of the data path, and then there's sort of a config path within the protocol and other interesting um, side things. So uh, initial enrollment and password change can be done through OFX. Uh, messaging from the bank to you, notifications from you to the bank, and lots of functionality that's sort of obviously there to help transition a, a, a small bank, a traditional bank, into the digital age. Uh, so you can download images and PDFs like within the protocol. Uh, sort of meant as like a scan of your bank statement instead of sending it to, the, to you in the mail. You know, it's a, an obvious like first step getting away from mailing you, but it's just scanning a PDF and sending you the exact same thing. This protocol is complex. It's got a 650 page specification and it's actively developed and growing. With that complexity, we all know, comes insecurity. I mentioned it goes over HTTP. Uh, so here we're going to actually look at some, some captures of sorts. Uh, this is the standard HTTP header. Uh, you're doing a post request to a well-known URL. Um, request response, as I said, uh, that URL is almost always just some kind of um, base path and then, and then server handler. You remember CGI, it's, it's, it was definitely based off that. Uh, there's a unique content type, application, uh, X, OFX, uh, and uh, some servers, not all servers, do user agent filtering, so uh, I'm, I'm using the, uh, the Intuit client app uh, user agent here in these examples. So I, uh, the same slide, I just dropped those HTTP headers, make the text a little bigger, and we can look at the real protocol. It's got a header that mostly remains static. It tells us the version number, which is the most interesting part. Uh, and then the body, it looks like HTML, right? We've got, we've got elements and tags uh, nested within each other. We've got span elements, we've got block level elements. Uh, it's actually SGML which if you've never heard of, neither had I, SGML was invented after HTML, but before XML. So they were like, you know, a little bit of rigidity uh, t so that you can parse it well, but not, not a lot, uh, still, still some wiggle room. You, you, can tell it's not, you can tell it's SGML because there's no closing tags on the span elements. Uh, those, those become required in XML. Uh, it's hard to get an SGML parser today. Python deprecated it in 2.6, which was years and years ago. Um, so that's that's interesting note. And uh, you'll notice plain text user ID. It's basically HTTP basic auth. Every one of your requests sends your username and password plain text in every request, all over TLS. Uh, so it's not it's not stiff. TLS is required, 
um, but no challenge response, um, no, no session token. There is, there is a session token mechanism of sorts. I have not seen it used. And uh, there's this financial ID that's sort of optional. Um, sometimes you need to specify the, the numeric value for the bank, sometimes, sometimes you don't. And on the response, there's a status code inside every block saying success or, or a unique error message. So pretty, pretty easy to parse, very human readable, and all outlined in a, in a decently written spec. So typical protocol flow, we saw this in GUI. This is the same thing over the wire. The client makes a profile request, which can be made anonymously, gets a bunch of capabilities uh, from the server. Hey, do you support banking? Do you support investment? Then it sends a account info request, getting the list of accounts. That one has to be authenticated so it can look up your accounts. Then it sends a, a statement request, getting all of your transactions. Here's an example of the profile request. Um, that last one we looked at was just the, the simplest authentication. Now we actually are asking for some data back in the body. Uh, this profile request, anonymous sign-in, profrq, you don't really have to pass any data at all. And you get back a lot. You get back a lot of interesting info from a server sitting on the internet uh, that anyone can query with anonymous credentials about what it, what it supports. This example, we've got the bank message set. It's telling me checking accounts and uh, savings accounts likely uh, are, are available. Uh, this X for prof tells me that I can do money transfers uh, to different accounts. That's, that's uh, intra-bank uh, money transfers. And then also in the profile is uh, information about the bank, 1997. Most banks didn't have websites yet. So this was sort of seen as like the way you were going to talk to your bank and they might not have a website. So the you know, physical address of the bank, um, an email, so you, can, you can talk to someone at the bank. That all, that all comes back with this profile request. So a timeline, 1997, uh, Microsoft, who's making Microsoft money, Intuit, who's making Quicken, and Checkfree, who's since got bought out and it's not a common name, um, all collaborated to make this protocol. They each had their own proprietary protocol, which uh, your client had to use to talk to the bank. Presumably it was hard getting a bank to implement even one, so they merged together and, uh, and, and put their combined weight to, to get the banks to actually run uh, one of these OFX servers. 2005, uh, the FDIC sees a lot of banks are going online and says, okay, we should, we should make sure the security here is, is uh, up to snuff. So FDIC, the, the um, US federal government deposit insurance corporation, who, make, you know, who has to pay out when, when banks lose, uh, lose money, says, okay, guidance, all banks should, not must, but strongly should, use multi-factor authentication for any of their online um, access. So in response to that, a new version of the spec comes out, 2006, uh, called 1.03 with MFA, which we'll go into. They transition it to XML, uh, 2007, Brand new, beautiful spec with OAuth came out in November. It's eight months old. No one has implemented it. It is not in the wild yet. Uh, I'm hopeful. And you might notice there's a big gap here between 2006 and 2017. Pure speculation, but uh, 2009, Microsoft decides that Microsoft Money, uh, their premier uh, personal finance management software, it's not worth it. They, they drop it, the uh, team stops developing it. And, and two things happen. Um, Intuit, now sort of being the only player in town, gets lazy and starts charging people $100 a year for the exact same version of Quicken, 2010, 2011, 2012. No, no software improvements whatsoever because they have no competition and they don't need to try. Uh, but on the good side, 
uh, there's this whole uh, community effort because people loved Microsoft money. And so a lot of geeks started like posting on forums and putting up web pages and finding these, finding out about OFX and writing clients. And that's what all of my work is built on is, uh, is these guys in sort of 2009 through 2011 who uh, wanted to replace Microsoft money with a bunch of Python scripts and Excel spreadsheets. So let's talk about MFA. Quick refresher that most everyone knows uh, in this room, multi-factor authentication, something you know, something you have, uh, and or something you are. The point is to remove the brute force password attack or theft of your password as valid attacks against, uh, against your account things that uh, individuals are, are quite susceptible to. Banks have been doing two-factor authentication for 50 years uh, with your ATM card. You have your card, you have your PIN number, something you have, something you know, they're good at this. In addition to multi-factor, uh, sort of security community has, has finally settled on the name uh, two-step authentication better than, than one factor, but not as good as multi-factor. Uh, we see this a lot. We see this a lot in banks. We still see it with Twitter. Uh, getting an SMS code uh, instead, of, instead of something you physically have, some sideband channel of information. Uh, again, better, better than, one, than one factor, but not as good as, as two. So 2006, MFA is should, not must, by FDIC, what is, what is the protocol, uh, the protocol implementers do? They have four different solutions in the specification. One is uh, this user cred. Uh, one is this MFA challenge. They're both basically the uh, asking questions about your mother's maiden name that you all know and love. In fact, the second one is hard-coded in the spec. These are the questions that you will ask as a server to the client. 2018, we all realize uh, these are both something you know. These are things that are somewhat obvious or, or easily available to learn about a person. And moreover, I, 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 have the, like, I have the cheat sheet before the test, right? Oh, OK, I need to find out these 20 things about this person. And then I can definitely log into their account. You know, their zip code. The other two forms, a little better. Client UID, auth token. Um, I'll start on the right. Auth token, server generated, um, sort of GUID uh, that uh, sends the client, client has to send it back every time. Uh, it's sort of key value-ish. It could be used to hold like TOTP, like one-time password codes, um, but they don't, they don't do that. Nobody uses it. Client UID is what everyone is sort of standardized on. Uh, as the second factor. It is client-generated uh, GUID. Client sends it the first time, server records it. Every time, henceforth, the client has to send that same UID, otherwise the server will stop trusting them. So it's tofu, it's trust on first use. Um, but actually, uh, people have like more than one computer, and this is recognized um, in the spec and in the implementation guidelines. Like people have a desktop and a, and a laptop, people have a phone. So it's actually trust on first four uses. <laughs> Sometimes two. Uh, but yeah, so like if you see it, you've never seen this client and they make up an ID, well as long as you don't have more than like one or two already stored, sure, they're also the same person. <laughs> and that is the state of the art in multi-factor authentication within the protocol that passes your money. But I have good news. Because that's in version 103 and no one's running 103. <laughs> They're running 102. 80% <laughs> of the implementations in the wild are not running, are running the version that was written in 1997. 20% um, are running the version that in theory can support multi-factor uh, and no one is running the OAuth version. Good news.
So let's talk about the financial institutions, these banks we love. We all know these big names. Uh, most of us probably have an account somewhere here. These are from like the, the top 20 by assets of, of U.S. banks. Uh, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, American Express for credit cards. Um, OFX is used is used by these guys. OFX is uh, is also used by YOLO. You only live once, Federal Credit Union. <laughs> this is me participating in bank branch tourism. I flew to California and then drove two hours to get this photo for you. I have a lot of bank accounts. <laughs> and if that's not enough, why don't you guys start a bank? Jack Henry will help you. Are you ready to start a bank? We have tips and advice. Jack Henry is one of the major software providers of OFX. The more banks there are, the um, more money they make, the more software they sell. Start a bank. So if anyone wants to start a bank, like with me after this, we can, we'll see if we can hack it out tonight. So I learned there are a lot of banks. Like, a lot. US and Canada, uh, other countries are much more restrictive. But uh, there, are, there are, according to uh, Intuit, 15,000 FIs, financial institutions. Um, about, according to, to OFX Consortium, 7,000 banks at one time have deployed uh, an OFX server. My personal scanning shows about 2,000 unique institutions on the internet right now. Um, that compresses down to, to 400 unique servers because there's actually a lot of service providers, sort of like web hosting, OFX hosting companies in this space. But there are a lot of banks in the US and Canada. Many of these are the same company. Like uh, when you have a Target branded credit card, that's an FI. When you have like a, you know, a, a Quiznos branded credit card, that's considered a financial institution. Um, so uh, it's, it's not purely like separate uh, business entities. Um, there is some indication that that difference between the 7,000 number and the 2,000 number is a decrease in popularity of people running OFX servers, um, which is sad, but also good, because it's insecure. As a quick aside, um, uh, I got banned for life from Capital One. It's another story for another time, but I was doing like these large uh, cash transactions. There was some Bitcoin. In retrospect, maybe it looked like money laundering or very successful drug dealing. <laughs> totally legit, though. Uh, I tried opening an account. It's been five years. I'm still banned for life. Uh, and I was a little worried. Like I was a bit like, oh my god, I, was just, I don't have a bank account. Um, uh, and had I known, like, there's, there's 4,999 other people who are willing to take my money. So yeah, don't, don't worry about getting banned from your bank. So let's go into my, my investigation. Uh, this, this, now we're going to go into implementation and deployment. I wanted to do a survey. I love Shodan. I love just, like, surveying the Internet. I want to, like, you know, I want to find out how, how big is the problem, how big is the problem space. I want to ask these two questions. Um, you know, what financial institutions are even running these servers? And what, what software are they running? Two simple questions to ask. Uh, here's the point where I say, my research was only reconnaissance. I am sending packets at live production Fortune 500 company systems. I do not want to even accidentally take one down uh, or, or gain unauthorized access. So I did very simple recon, uh, like uh, enumerating the host and sending GET requests. Enumerating the host, this, that's the tricky part um, up front, but there's this great OFX um, community who has sort of kept a database of these servers um, for several years. OFXHome.org uh, is, is the best one. They've got, a, they've got a great website. This is where you can find out how to talk to your bank directly. Uh, GNU Cache keeps stuff. Uh, you, know, you, Google, you Google them, you'll find them, but OFX.Home is the, is the best. 
commercial clients, Quicken, they have what they call the branding service. You, you put in a name and it sends it off to their server and sends you back a, a URL um, for, that, for that bank name. And the URLs look like that up at the top. Usually a subdomain, uh, then some subdirectory in the path, and then some, uh, some server handler. Uh, interestingly, this is, this is hard to mask scan. Like, it's hard to script this because you're not looking for a port. You're looking for a web service at a path, and that path can be anything. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't come up with a good way of, you know, sort of finding these out of the ether. You sort of have to know they already exist or, you know, call the bank and ask them. So after I enumerated uh, a large number of hosts, uh, we just do a proof of life. Like, just, just make a TLS connection and see if that thing's even alive. Uh, a lot of this data is stale. It's from 2011. Um, so it's kind of an archaeology adventure talking to servers, you know, set up um, five, ten years ago. What I find from a TLS connection? Uh, stale DNS. 232 are still listed in DNS, but the IP doesn't, doesn't accept a TCP connection. Not a big deal, like no exploit, but it's sort of like hinting at, at neglect, hinting at, okay, so someone, you know, didn't clean out their DNS, how, how long is that going to live there? 15, that will accept a TLS connection, but tell you that their cert is bad and expired for years. So we got 15 hosts that have, assumedly, my data still on them, um, but that no one's looking at. No one is maintaining these, these servers. Bigger red flag. I've connected. Let's send get slash and see what we get. Like, you know, web server profiling 101. I get a lot of banners. Sure. Okay. So not the best, you know, configuration. Didn't turn off that you're using IIS. Start getting um, OFX banners. Hey, this is this is handy. This is the OFX server version. Thanks. Build number, version number, date it was released, time it was built. Very useful for me to start planning my attack. More of the same. Anybody notice something weird about that build date? Two thousand seven. Okay, uh, they're web servers. Let's talk to the OFX servers. What's the simplest possible, like, valid protocol um, it, within spec that I can send? An empty, an empty tag, an empty, you know, base tag. Let's start sending that. Error, Java lang null pointer exception. Okay, parser error, not handling not handling, not getting the elements that you think are always there. That's worth looking into. This is like a threefer. The header is it's like it starts, but then it stops writing the header. And then the message has two spaces because I didn't send, I didn't send a financial ID, so it's doing some sort of printf, um, you know, string replacement of data that I sent in, and it's going to reflect it back to me. Um, this database error, quick Google, tell, Google search tells you it's, uh, it's an IBM DB2 database that returns that error, you know, straight from the database into the application server back to the client. No scrubbing. Ooh, stack trace. This is what I was looking for. Getting warmer. Stack trace with a full qualified path on the local system to where the code is and what line of the code failed. Yes. That was like, I mean, I sent nothing. I sent, I sent a header in eight characters. So let's switch. Now I want like real data. I, like I want to. I don't want to cause errors. I don't want it to just give me a profile. Just tell me about yourself. Like you know, first first question on a first date. Um, send the profile request. First part of every transaction that Quicken's going to do. Uh, and here's that here's that session uh, session token of sorts. 
uh, that I, I talked about. Um, I, I was signing in as anonymous, so first it shouldn't have given me a session token, but it did. Uh, and then it's uh, a year long. So this, this server gives out year long session tokens. If I ever steal one, then I can read your account, you know, password equivalent for, for a year. Uh, the profile response, thankfully, uh, tells me all about the password policy of that server because I have to send passwords so the client has to know how to validate. Uh, this one, uh, minimum, four characters. Maximum, four characters. <laughs> Not case sensitive. No special characters allowed, no spaces. Uh, I'll do the math for you. Uh, it's about a million and a half total combinations. If you could check 10 a second uh, online, take you about two days to brute force the entire key space that is possible for all usernames at this bank. Thankfully, I don't even remember what bank that is, so I can't tell you. <laughs> I was just asking for anonymous information. Uh, third and last uh, sort of query uh, I did uh, was uh, give me an account list. For anonymous user, which is you know, specified in the spec, you can send this anonymous user this well-known string, uh, I should definitely get an error, right? I should get either uh, on you know, authentication failed or no accounts found. Simple, easy to program. Two, two error cases. Here is what that request looks like. This is the entire request. Uh, very small, just asking for account info. And here uh, is the error message. Or error messages. Same request sent to about uh, 2,000 different servers. This is a subset of the error messages I got back. How, how many different implementations are running out there? How many different configurations? What? Sign on invalid, unsupported operation for anonymous, general error, user ID password combination incorrect. How many, how many ways did it say, like, I failed login? So let's talk about the financial vendors. Who's, who's building this software and how many implementations are there? Uh, this is, a, this is a, a great little chart, not mine. It's from one of the financial software vendors explaining bank software. Three parts you need to know. On the left, you have what they call the core. The core is a database and batch processing. It makes sure the bank knows how much money it has at the end of every day. Uh, in the middle uh, is middleware. Uh, that's every bank service, customer facing service that you're familiar with, bill pay and um, remote deposit and dealing with your ATM. And then user experience, mobile, web on, on the right, three pieces. Every square on this diagram can be provided by a single vendor or the same vendor in the financial software world. Imagine the combinations of complexity within the bank IT system when, and this definitely happens, every one of these squares is a different vendor. These are not shrink wrap boxes or apt get installs or you know, app stores. Uh, these are high touch call to talk to sales, negotiated deals for online banking solutions. A lot of these servers don't even have names. They're just the solution provided by the company. And OFX is, is one very small part of this ecosystem. Often a deployment like this uh, involves custom development per bank. Not custom deployment, custom development, like code written just for bank A and then different code written just for bank B because, you know, abstraction uh, doesn't exist. It, I mean, it's vendor lock-in, obviously. It's a, way, it's a way for the vendor to, to, to assure they'll, be, they'll get their re-up on the next contract. Here's a list from Intuit on the banks that support, uh, sorry, the vendors that support OFX. This is their official list. I found nine more not on this list. Assumedly, they're no longer like, you know, preferred partners or some such. So we've got uh, 30 plus different vendors of, of this singular protocol. 
Uh, these are the big guys. Uh, I didn't have enough data, unfortunately, to give you like uh, who's the biggest um, apples to apples comparison. Uh, just a couple names, FIS and Fiserv, they're uh, multi-billion dollar companies. They're the, they're the Microsoft and the Googles of, of banking software. Uh, then Enterprise Engineering and Q2, they're, um, they're sort of the up and comers. They've, they've established themselves as seeing a lot more servers um, with uh, advertising themselves as, as these two companies. Uh, it's a little small, but uh, the Enterprise Engineering logo says, the name to trust for financial data solutions. I don't want to make fun of them, but it's on their website, <laughs> which is not over HTTPS. And they forgot to pay their Google Platform API bill. You can go there right now, it still looks like this. We all have bad IT days. Like the people who build the website are not the people who build the OFX software. I know, but if you put the trusted name and financial software on every web page, you should not have this page can't load Google Maps correctly also there. And then there's the hosting providers uh, who play a big role. Uh, so two thirds of these, uh, these FIs are behind hosting providers uh, now. It's like everyone's going to the Amazon cloud and Azure. Everyone's, everyone's you know, going to hosting providers for good reason, right? They can, do, they can do a better job at security than your ma and pa like credit union in your town of 4,000 people. Uh, their security is better, not good, but better than the, the self-hosted ones. Um, I don't fully understand all the back end details uh, between the OFX server because I'm just poking it from the front. Uh, but uh, a lot of these are batch jobs. So like the, the, the you know, the, your OFX server sits in some data center and it pulls and gets your transactions like every 24 hours. So that's why if you're actually using Quicken or something, you often, you don't see your, your, your credit card um, transactions ASAP. It, there's a, there's a, a batch processing in the back end. A bunch of different stacks, of course, across 35 development vendors. Um, this is mainly just server headers. There's a lot of IS, but there's plenty of Apache. There's a whole long tail. Several of these are custom HTTP servers written by the, the OFX provider. And there's a ton of acquisition. Uh, banks love M&A, like, like divestiture and, and acquisition. Uh, these are compilers and debuggers to banks. Like they just do this every day, over and over again. Spin this company out, buy that company back. Uh, we do this in tech too. Uh, it's not it's not a bad thing, but we all, uh, if you've been through an acquisition, you know, like sometimes the new company totally forgets about the tool you wrote, and it just atrophies. Um, so there's a ton of that uh, in this industry. This uh, this is from FIS. Four of these names up here had um, you know first party OFX servers, and then they got acquired. And then, and then things went downhill. The vulnerabilities, some quick math. This is not like a PhD level uh, algorithm that I applied. Um, but across this much complexity, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of vulnerabilities. And I mean, as you saw, like, None of these are zero days. None of these are, I got your money. But from like sending a get request, there shouldn't be this much smoke. It shouldn't, it, this shouldn't be this much bad from the level of effort that I had to put in with a web browser and curl. On the left, uh, that's a list of like stuff we already talked about. On the right, there's things that I don't have time to talk about. Uh, I have a bank that still uses my social security number as the username for OFX. Not for the website, but for the OFX protocol, I gotta use my social security number. I um, uh, found some unregistered URLs. You can, you know, you can just, you, can, you want to start a bank? And reflected, reflected cross-site scripting. I know it's not HTML, and yet I got an XSS attack here. Okay, let's play along at home. So uh, everything I did, I, I hacked together in Python, but I wanted to give it to you guys so that you could try it too professional pen testers for financial institutions for people writing the software. Let's, like, let's build a tool, let's, let's make this better. Uh, it's not action on GitHub, it'll be there in a couple of days, but it is, it, it is real and it exists and I'll show it to you now. A 
CLI tool uh, that's going to go through and sort of do what what um, what I what I showed you. It takes a couple arguments: the the URL, the server you want to talk to, optionally the financial ID if you know it. It's not it's not always required. Uh, you get this all from ofxhome.org. You can find your bank uh, and and run it against it right now. Send some queries. Does some analysis. Scroll back up and. We sent that get to slash. We sent the uh, post to OFX path. We sent the empty OFX payload. We, we store those all uh, locally and then we just scan through them. Uh, from that profile data, uh, we're going to get financial institution. Make sure that's the real one you want to talk to, um, their address, their info. Uh, we're going to get that OFX sort of header version information, run in 102. Um, this is a service provider, LAN Extra. We're going to get the capabilities uh, sort of in this um, markdown format. It's a banking server. They do support transfers. Fingerprint, uh, it's running Apache Tomcat. Couldn't figure out the web framework. Software fingerprint, uh, Finastra is the company uh, that built the software. It's called Cavion. Figured that all out from what they told me. Couldn't get the version number. And then a couple simple tests. They fail MFA immediately because they're running 102. And their password policy is also not very good. So uh, Sunday, maybe, it should be up. If not Monday, um, you can check my Twitter and I'll, I'll, have, uh, I'll, I'll post as soon as uh, it's up and available. You can download and you can run it. OFX is your bank's digital side door. It's not a back door. Uh, that's like hidden and secret. And the front door, uh, you know, I mean, that's the web app and that's the, that's the mobile app. Uh, it's the front door but with less care and less security and less attention. It's the side door. Uh, we all know that attackers are going to go for the weakest door into your finances. It's a sad story. I don't want to be a downer, but uh, neglect is the word that kept like jumping into my mind. Uh, it's a lack of investment. Uh, I've I've talked to bankers. I've talked to bank IT guys. Um, they I mean they they literally say uh, we pay the system integrator. They they install everything. Um, five months later, I call them again. They give us the upgrade. That's, that's the state of a lot of IT in 2018 at, at your local financial institution. It's an even sadder story for the consumer because this was 1997. Like, we had an open protocol with programmatic access to our finances, no vendor lock in, like, no, no loss of privacy, just you and your bank. And it didn't go, it didn't go anywhere, it didn't, it didn't take off like it should have. Like how much how much better could our banking experience be today if Microsoft hadn't like you know stopped com stopped competing? I wish my bank uh, would have started when it was younger, but it's never too late to plan for retirement. When you set up a server, like have a plan on how you're going to take it down. When you deploy a TLS certificate, like make a make a Google Calendar like message to when you when you have to update it. Monitor your finances. Monitor monitor your network. Uh, know know what you're running. Uh, know every service you're running, not just not just the front door. This was only recon. Uh, one protocol, one endpoint in a rat's nest of bank middleware. Uh, I had fun. I'm going to keep building off of this. I'm going to keep uh, building out that tool. Uh, if anyone wants to help, PRs are welcome. If anyone's from a bank and wants to, you know, wants to tell me more, um, good stories. I uh, would love to talk to you. Uh, all of you, please take the research, uh, build off of it, and, and help make our personal finances more secure. Thank you.